As a historian, what I'm most interested in actually, and this comes back to the question of how, why we should understand the pandemic this way, is really two questions about disasters. And one is, what are the conditions that make disasters possible? And it's linked crucially to questions of vulnerability. That is, a disaster for me isn't only created by an event, it's created by an event plus certain kinds of vulnerability. From the University of Toronto, I'm Randy Boyagoda, and this is What Now? Edward Jones Imhotep is a historian of the social and cultural life of machines and also the director of the Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science and Technology here at the University of Toronto. His research and teaching explore the boundaries between technology and nature, and he's interested in when and how these have changed over history. He's also interested in the relationship between machines and social order, and especially what happens after breakdowns, malfunctions, accidents, and maybe, Edward, after pandemics? I'm thinking about the fact that you, you teach about disasters and history. So how do you define a disaster? Was the pandemic a disaster? And if so, what's gained by conceiving of it that way? So I think, you know, for me, there are many ways, I guess, to define a disaster. You know, a disaster is an interruption in what people understand as the, the, the order of things. And that order of things can be understood as uh, a certain understanding of how society does or should function. It can be other things, the kind of natural uh, events, the kind of natural course of, of, of natural history. All these things can be understood. Those kinds of interruptions can be understood as disasters. Um, but you know, partly I think uh, what ends up happening is that we, we perceive a disaster often as having to be or having to involve some kind of sudden change. Um, and for a long time, that's how we understood disasters, I think, predominantly, is that it's some form of sudden disruption in the order of things. But there's been a lot of really fascinating work over the last two decades um, that talks about slow disasters, in fact, and how it is that a disaster can also end up taking shape um, so gradually, in fact, that people don't recognize when they've crossed a kind of tipping point. So climate change, for instance, is a good example of this. But the second uh, element of disaster that I think is really important is that although disasters are exceptional in the order of things, they're also recurrent. Mm -hmm. And so even though we don't know what specific disasters might end up befalling us, we know for certain that there will be more disasters. Yes. And the last element, though, that I think defines disaster pretty critically is just the notion of destruction and usually wide scale destruction. So that destruction can take many forms. It can take the form of human life. It can take the form uh, of you know, material environments. Uh, it can take the form of hope kind of symbolically um, in disaster. But there's always this notion uh, of destruction itself. And because there's that notion of destruction, there's very often also associated with it the idea of a possibility for new beginnings. So a question like, what now? So then, is the pandemic, was the pandemic a disaster, or should we think of it that way? I think it, it was a disaster, and I think that we should think about it that way. And I think that there's a case to be made, actually, for thinking about pandemics in general as disasters. So the cholera pandemic, for instance, of the 19th century, or the Spanish flu, 1918 Spanish flu. For what we can gain from that, um, you know, disasters are incredibly powerful ways that we use to understand ourselves, our history, our environments. As a historian, what I'm most interested in actually, and this comes back to the question of how, why we should understand the pandemic this way, is really two questions about disasters. And one is, what are the conditions that make disasters possible? And it's linked crucially to questions of vulnerability. That is, a disaster for me isn't only created by an event, it's created by an event plus certain kinds of vulnerability. Right, have you, have you seen Waiting for Superman? I haven't seen this. Waiting for Superman is now, to my mind, an example of the, the slow disaster of publicly funded education in the United States. And it's about the lottery system for getting into some of the better public schools, magnet schools, I think they're called maybe, in New York. And the idea is that um, your prospects, especially for... Uh, children of poor socioeconomic background or minoritized children are often both. Um, the trajectory is radical if you get into one of these particular magnet schools or whatever they're called, but it's a lottery system, right? And in a sense, what that exposed, even just from what you were just describing, is the basically the permanent disaster of underfunded public education in major urban 
uh, sections of the United States, right? And that you wouldn't realize was, but for the fact that there's this way out that really, that is actually a lottery system. That's exactly the kind of vulnerability that I have in mind. So even if you take something, for instance, like take Krakatoa, the eruption of Krakatoa in 1883. Mm. You know, if, if that kind of eruption had happened out in the middle of the Pacific with relatively small tsunamis, we wouldn't be calling it a disaster. The fact that it ends up happening next to some of the, one of the most populated regions of the world at the Malacca Strait, at the intersection of Java and Sumatra, invokes this kind of millennia long history of human migration, of agricultural patterns that concentrate people in this area. Layered on top of that is you know, Dutch colonialism, for instance, that makes it also a kind of a trade route as well. Those things are, plus the eruption of Krakatoa, are the things that turn it into a disaster. Yeah, I see. And so there's a way in which it, it, that, that understanding, for instance, this pandemic is a disaster, makes us look also at the long history of the conditions that allowed something like this to end up happening. Right. That created the kinds of disparities, for instance, that we had across the world. In a sense, so in other words, machines like technology, like disasters, they, they all kind of have that same disruptive and intensive, in, intensifying effect on us. I teach this class for, for St. Michael's, where in the, opening, in the opening lecture, I invite students to imagine a woman living in a remote village in England 1,000 years ago. And then I ask students to reflect on what they envy about her life, what they would imagine she would envy about ours, and what we would recognize in each other's lives still. And what I'm always struck by is students will inevitably point out how much technology we have, and that she would, whether envy or not, she would be amazed at our technology. And then I, you know, in a, in a playful but pointed way, point out that technology didn't begin with the iPhone, that she absolutely had technology. But, you know, in your work, given the fact that you are a historian of technology, has anything changed in terms of our I don't know, almost triumphalist anxieties about our relationship to technology when I imagine a thousand years ago, people had relationships to technology, didn't they? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And in fact, part of the difficulty is that we conceive of technology, I think, too narrowly. So, you know, a pen and paper is a technology, a paperclip is a technology. So technology has formed part, a really critical part of human history for as long as we have recorded history we have and, and, and beyond that. So on the question of, of anxiety, um, you know, I, I, that's something that I think is just inherent to our relationship to, to material devices of certain kinds. You know, most novel devices, many novel devices will generate some kind of anxiety because they're an interruption in the way that things have been done up until that point. So um, something, for instance, that we take for granted now, like the bicycle, when it was first introduced, was seen by many people as this object of immorality um, and danger because you know young men would race them down the streets and run people was over. It, I think it was in the TLS. I heard a, I just recently read a reference to it as the devil's horse. Yes, exactly right, exactly right. Uh, and you know, women, for instance, would change their dress because the dresses would get caught in the in the, the mechanism, and so they started wearing either shorter dresses or, or pants, interrupting kind of no, gender norms. Sure. Um, so there's a way in which you know something that we take completely for granted is something that is you know unproblematic in many ways, a bicycle, morally at least uh, unproblematic in a lot of ways, a bicycle, uh, was seen when it was introduced really as this very, very problematic object. Um, but at the same time also, I think that technologies in general, machines, they are also repositories of more general anxiety. So it's not necessarily that the, it's not just because they introduce an interruption, but they, they provide an occasion for us to express other kinds of anxieties that aren't necessarily about technology, mm. but through which technology becomes a kind of a medium for their expression. And they even they can even, in many ways, shape and structure our very articulations. What I'm thinking about would be, uh, I think I was our youngest daughter. She might have been three years old. I remember her wandering around our house with a broken pencil, saying that she had to charge this. Thing. <laughs> she awesome. needed to charge it because that was how she had structured her understanding. When something's not working in our house, it's because you have to charge it, right? Yeah, exactly right. So, and you have you have this recurring again and again and again, right? Like, if you think, for instance, about the moment that we're in and the anxiety about things like artificial intelligence, AI. Mm. Yeah, you could say that that's about AI, sure. 
But you could also say that the debates that take place through AI as a kind of an occasion for this are, are the real subject for those kinds of debates are things like surveillance, mm -hmm. about the control of large corporations. And other technologies have also been the focus of that historically. So, you know, UFOs, for instance, in the United States are part of, they're the object, the point of expression of a larger anxiety in the United States about things like conspiracy, sure. right, and kind of government action, right, uh, the, 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 the deep state. So there's a way in which those anxieties will never go away, mm -hmm. uh, partly because new machines and new technologies generate them, and partly also because they are the occasion for a more generalized anxiety. Okay. What are we talking about when we talk about black androids? Uh, uh, yeah, this is a subject very dear to my heart. Um, so in the most general terms, um, Androids are automata, so they're, they're self-moving machines that take the form of human beings. So in that sense, black androids, again, in the most general terms, are automata that take the form of black humans. So, you know, if you had asked me, for instance, um, two years ago, what is a black android? I probably would have pointed you to Afrofuturism, mm -hmm. right? Like, if you think of the work of, um, like, Janelle Monet, the artist and, um, actor, musician. She uses the figure of the black android in this um, trilogy, the Metropolis trilogy drawn on um, Fritz Lang's 1927 film, inspired by it, uh, where she uses the android actually as a figure, a representation of the minority and also of liberation, of the potential for liberation. So okay, that's what I would have thought of. So about 18 months ago, though, I started to see references to actual historical black androids. So to actual machines, automata in the form of black humans. That were intentionally designed as such. They were intentionally designed as such. So I, you know, I, I didn't think very much of it at the time, but I kept seeing them just, you know, scattered references to them. And so as part of the Jackman Humanities Institute Scholars in Residence program, I ended up assembling this team of just unbelievable undergraduate research assistants. In two weeks, we had uncovered 150 yeah. of them. Um, and these are real machines that were built at some point. Um, and so that was fascinating to me. And just, just so I can understand, how do they, how do you know they're black? I hate to ask a very simplistic question, but in kind of plain terms, how do you know they're black androids? So there, it's actually a deeper question maybe than you're letting on. I know that you probably intend it that way, but it's, it's, more, it's much deeper than you let on. So partly it's you know, because of things like coloration, right? But also it's because these are, um, almost exclusively for the periods that we're interested in racist objects. Mm -hmm. That is, so they trade on racist stereotypes. Um, and this, it signals two like super important things I think about these androids. Uh, one is that they use the machine, the, the technologies of their age. So they're driven by things like steam engines or electricity, for instance, or clockwork, to depict black people as non-technological. They have a huge irony embedded in them. So the surface appearance of the android usually ends up showing black people in pastoral roles or doing some kind of agricultural work or playing a flute or smoking a pipe or something like this. And they are part, we are convinced, they are part of a more general mythology that is cultivated uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries that puts blackness in opposition to technology, that it treats black people as, as, as untechnological or non-technological. But the other thing that I think is so critical about them is that amazingly, the same technologies that drive them are actually an integral part of the lives of black diasporic peoples themselves. So as an example, you know, the, the first Android ever patented in the United States is something called the Dedrick Steam Man. It's patented in 1868. And the patent drawing depicts the android as, a black, as an African-American man pulling a, pulling a cart and driven by a steam engine. And the point is though that at that same moment, you have an incredible history of black involvement in steam technologies. So for instance, during the Civil War, uh, one of the <clears throat> most important designers actually of steam engines um, was uh, a slave. 
who couldn't patent his devices because slaves couldn't hold patents. Uh, steam technologies themselves were used as fugitive technologies during the Civil War. So um, steamships, for instance, uh, Frederick Douglass escapes on a steam train uh, from, from slavery as well. So th there's a way in which steam, steam technologies form an incredible place in the lives, in, in, in the, the cultural imaginations and in the, the social and material lives of black Americans, for instance, at precisely this time. And what that shows then is that we have all just been lied to. There has been this mythology that has been cultivated through things like the black androids about this opposition between blackness and technology right. that the historical materials themselves and historical examples completely belie. Um, they end up exposing really not only the mythologies that are created, but how pernicious those mythologies have been uh, and how unjust they've been, both historically and the way that in which they shape even contemporary understandings for instance, of who belongs in technology, who is technological, who can be a technological self. Uh, it seems to me like you've got a, a Jordan Peele script <laughs> built into everything we're talking about here. If you think about some of his recent movies. Yeah, absolutely. I think that you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, one of the ambitions that we have for this actually is uh, a graphic novel. But the, the potential for this, for both a kind of reimagination of the relationship between technology and blackness, one way, one that aligns more closely actually with the Afrofuturist model on one hand, and also one that delves much, much more deeply into the actual lived histories and experiences of black peoples in the relationship to technology. I think that the, the floodgates are open for something like this. And, and just, you know, in closing, given the work that you get to do as a researcher, as a writer, as a, as a teacher, as, a, as a, uh, a leader here at the university, Edward, Really, it's fantastic that you can make this history not only um, relevant, but demonstrate, as you say, the kind of active and real and continuing lines between the past and the present and the future. What Now is a production of University of Toronto Communications. It's hosted by me, Randy Boyagoda, and produced by Lisa Lightborn. Follow us and listen wherever you get your podcasts.